We had finished the renovation. We had it staged and it wasn't selling. We kept dropping the price. It wasn't selling, it wasn't selling. But then that's when I went in the hospital. My water broke at 22 weeks pregnant with yeah. our youngest son. By the time we were all said and done with holding costs, repairs, all the over repairs, we had to over borrow yeah. the money. The $40,000 in extra staging. Yeah, that was a whole debacle in itself. So that was that was crazy. And we ended up losing $147,312 in that yeah, deal. Yeah, that was not a fun day. Welcome back to the Fearless Future podcast. We're your hosts, Glenn Schwarm. And Amber Schwarm. And today, we're going to talk horror stories. We're going to talk about things that are probably going to terrify you and make you never, ever, ever want to be a real estate investor once you learn what can actually happen to people like us. I feel like I'm about to enter Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> so the topic is how to not lose $147,312 on one deal it's our monster flip that we thought was going to set us free, and it turned into an absolute horror story. Yeah. One of the things that's really important to us as we're, we're building our community is to be transparent, though. So we want to tell people the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, you know, if you're- This in, is definitely ugly. This is ugly. But if you're in business long enough, you're going to have deals where you lose money. Yeah. I, I love when I meet people that say, oh, I'm a real estate investor. I've never lost money on a single deal. My answer always is, you haven't done enough yet. Right. To be over a thousand deals, you're going to make some missteps. Yes. You're going to, you're going to swing, you know, if you never swing for the fences, you'll never strike out, right? True. You never get the plate. You'll never know. True. And so I think that for us, we had done, what was the year on this one? <clears throat> this has got to uh, be. Well, it was, it had to be 2014, 2015. So we have been in business for a number of years. We, at this point, we probably had a few hundred deals under our belt. Would yep. you guess? Yeah. And we were starting to get some notoriety, right? We were in local TV stations. We were at local we were on the new. We we're on the front of the business review right. for the capital region of New York, right? That was a big five-page article. Remember that? Yep. That was around the same time, and we're yes. we're getting we're getting maybe a little cocky, a little 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 cocky. But I but I also think we wanted to kind of like test our limits. Yeah. You know, we we wanted to be a little more aggressive, but that well, doesn't always work out so well. What was our buy box back then? It's first-time home buyers. Three or four bedrooms, two bath houses yep. that people that just sell like hotcakes. And the average price that we sold those for was a little under two hundred thousand. Correct. One eighty five. Every now and again, we do like two ten. Two fifty, maybe. Right, maybe that yeah. two fifty was a big one. Right. So we would do that from time to time. So if you remember, one of the women that worked for us brought us in this deal, English tutor English home, tutor, right? Yeah. How we spell it wrong? I spell like the like the teacher. That's not what it is. T u d o r. Yeah, not t u t o r. Tutor, right? <laughs> So yeah, one of the people who work for us made funny. She goes, it's not called a tutor. That's what a teacher is. Which that should have been. So so we should preface this with, even though we lost money on this deal and it was a horror story, we gained a lot of really valuable lessons. So we, and, well, that, and that's why this, we, that's why we like this. This more than a college education <laughs> on one true. deal. So we, but, we, we learned, learned a lot, but I, I really, I really we didn't spend $150,000 to learn. Well, you think. But but we like to share these stories though, so that other people can learn from our, these Correct. lessons and right. not make the same one. So don't be too terrified. Just try to understand that we made mistakes and hopefully you can learn in this episode yes. what not to do for yourself and what not to, uh, what mistakes not to make. So Correct. talk about it. What was the, that? We talked about what the what it was. Let's talk about that house in general. Because it, yeah. it was an English tutor, about 5,000 square it feet. It was big. Yeah, yes. it had, I don't remember, five or six bedrooms, four bathrooms. There was a hot tub in the house. There was a pool outside. The first red flag was that it, it was a tutor. So when you're when you're looking at houses, and this is one of the lessons that we learned, when you're looking at houses, you want to buy something that's going to appeal to the broadest number of buyers. And a tutor is very specialized. You know, there's only a certain number of people that are going to be attracted to a house in that style. Especially just, upstate New York. It wasn't common up there. Right. right. And then the other thing that we learned is that price tag. You know, even though it was in a really nice neighborhood and even though it was in a really good school district, there's just fewer and fewer buyers in in that buying pool. Well, I remember so, the. Do you remember what the amount was? I don't exactly. It was assessed for six ninety nine. So we thought most of the time houses in upstate New York are assessed for less than they actually sell for. Correct. And it was such a big house on such a big lot in a prestigious neighborhood in the yep. town of Niskayuna, the same town that the Airbnb founder of Airbnb founder. <laughs> went to school, right? So a um, little bit, a uh, little bit upper class. And so we thought, okay, how do we lose? Because we paid two fifty for it. Remember yeah. that? Do you remember the emotional tie that I had to it? I do remember. It was the daughter of the woman that delivered you when you were born. Can we discuss now that I was a New Year's baby? 
when you well, I think everybody should know that because <laughs> because just so you guys know, Glenn's head isn't big enough. He had he had to be the first baby born in New York State in 1969. He was born at 12:01 on January 1st. 12:01 a.m. Let's make sure we're clear yeah. on that. Very so, important information. So, so the whole world celebrates his birthday. Well, what do you what do you do? So, but the woman the woman that delivered me. Her daughter owned that house, right? right? Also an OBGYN. Correct. And she owned that house. So there was a little bit of emotional tie, like, wow, that'd be cool to buy that house. As it turns out, when we sold the house, that open house, the woman who delivered me came back, remember? I do. I got very emotional because that's the first person that ever saw me, right, come out. It was pretty, pretty so, cool. third lesson. So the first one was that it was a, a tutor. Yep. And so that there's not a lot of people that were attracted to that house. The yep. second was that the buyer's pool is lower in that price range. Yep. The third lesson is we bought the house based somewhat on emotion. We did. But also, if you remember, I would say this. We also jumped out of our normal buy box. Correct. Right? We normally would buy- Lesson number those, four. <laughs> those, those houses. And we said, we had this cookie cutter model that was churning out house after house after house successfully. It's almost like, you know, if you have a production line that makes Toyota cars, and it just makes Toyota cars over and over and over. It got really good at making Toyota cars. And all of a sudden, you throw in a BMW and say, well, just here, just throw the BMW in this line and just make that. It throws the whole thing off, Yeah. right? Our team didn't quite know what to do. It was so big. Contractors we had weren't used to be so big. Everything was had to be higher end. Remember that? It did because it was a nicer house. So we yes. couldn't use our normal cabinets. We couldn't use our normal appliances. We couldn't use the normal vanities that we used. And because it was so many bedrooms, it wasn't going to look good if it was just painted, yeah. you know, two colors. Like we yes. had to do some different colors here and there. There was a grand staircase and we had to do the oh, remember railing. That? That. I forgot oh, yeah. about the grand I mean, staircase. There, and that, and that hot tub in the house, that was a really big debacle Ugh. and all new tile. And we had to get that working and we should have just ripped it out. Yes. But it, there, was a, there was a lot of like... Weird things about that house. The landscaping alone. Do you remember what happened to you walking around the house from the oh, outside? Oh, gosh, yes. I got stung by hornets. Which some days you deserve. So <laughs> so anyway. Felt like pellet gun was shooting me as I was walking across the lawn, though. Yeah. That was not a fun day. Yes, you got nailed there pretty. We should have known that was We should have known that was probably a bad God, sign. God telling us to get out. Like, I'm trying to tell you, leave the property. Don't buy this thing that we already owned at that point, though. So, but the, I remember the landscaping being like, we us, we usually spend about 300 bucks to 400 bucks, maybe 500 bucks on landscaping outside of a house. This was like in the five to $10,000 range. Well, it was a big house right. and it had extensive landscaping. But again, things you don't think about when you're, no. when you're so, when your production line is used to saying, well, it's 500, let's just throw a couple thousand at that. That, yeah. that should cover it. But it doesn't. And you realize that there's so many beds and that was one more thing. And then the basement was so big yeah. and everything was just large and there was just, you know, Problem after problem, we had a leaky basement. Remember that? Even painting the house. Yes. Like, like it just, it was so massive. So yeah. many square feet. So again, the the other thing that was really bad is that because it was so much bigger, we did not really anticipate the extra holding costs, right? Yeah. The holding costs, the cost to hold a house. So you're paying your mortgage payment to your lenders, which was a lot more expensive because then we borrowed $400,000 in this house at 10%. Thinking That's, that that would cover the purchase and the renovation. Correct. And then- we had to buy insurance, which cost more a bigger house, yep. right? But then we had to pay for the taxes. Remember the taxes were? $18,000. $18,000 a year for the taxes. We thought we'd be in that house in a few months. We we held it for almost a year. Yeah. So we, I, and maybe it was even a couple months over a year. And that just eats away your profits. So we didn't anticipate that. And there really were no good comps. You couldn't find another tutor to comp it to. So right. we couldn't figure out what the exact amount to ask. So we went by the assessed value and we started out at seven ninety nine. And we got no bites and no bites and no bites. It was even in the newspaper or somewhere online or we, we got some press Oops, on it. We did. We got press on yeah. it because of the neighborhood, because of what we did to it. We got major press on it and it hit the front page of the real estate section on a Sunday morning. Remember that? I do. And we were like, oh yeah. Oh, remember what we did to try and sell it? Well. Remember what we tried, tried to do? The staging. Is that what no, you're talking about? No. Oh, oh, the car. We tried to give away a Lexus. Yes. We tried to give away a Lexus. We had an open house, a big, oh, uh, that was the biggest open house we ever did. We had it catered. We had champagne and wine and- Yeah, they really... served they serve duck, which I hate. Oh. <laughs> but they, but that was, that's, that's how fancy it was, champagne and everything. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves too. Wait, because we have to, because let's, there let's was, get there back was, to that story because yes. I want to make fun of my friend on this one. So go ahead. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so we were, we had finished the renovation. Yes. And we had it staged kind of lightly. Yep. Um, not not to the nines. You know, it wasn't fully staged. Yes. And it wasn't selling. We kept dropping the price. It wasn't selling. It wasn't selling. 
But then yes. that's when I went in the hospital. Yes. I my water broke at 22 weeks pregnant with yep. our youngest son. Yep, yep, um, yep. I was in the hospital for six weeks. So I was kind of out of commission. Yep. And so and you were out of commission too because you came to my side and you yep. were taking care of our two year old daughter at the time. And the other kids. And the kids. other kids. Yep. And and so another girl in the office said, I got you. I got your back. And so she hired somebody to come in and stage it fully. Forty grand or something like that. Oh yeah, it was forty it, grand. Brand she, new furniture. Brand new furniture that she bought from furniture stores and like and and it looked great, but she ended up changing some of the colors because she didn't like them. Um, and so forty grand later, and the house is still on the market, not selling, not selling, not selling. So we ended up doing that car yeah. giveaway. Yeah, we tried the car giveaway where we actually had Lexus dealer come out and bring a car to the front lawn, and we agreed. That we would do some kind of a drawing. I forgot what it was, but we would give away. We had, but there had to be a certain amount of people that in, that came or something. Provided we, I forget what the we had some stipulations, but yeah. as long as we sold the house, we were going to lease a Lexus for somebody for two years. It was going to cost us like maybe ten thousand dollars to lease it for two years. Yeah, but we figured, hey, what the heck? Like ten thousand dollars, it leases the car. We're trying to be as clever as we could. Right. That didn't do anything. Nothing. That went absolutely nowhere. That was complete flop, right? We had the Lexus dealer. They were they were pissed at us. We were being out there with the car. Oh my God. So, anyways, we're we're I'm remembering all these things. So we had that massive open house, which was very, very high end, right? All kinds of even the woman who delivered me showed up because she wanted to see her daughter's house. Yeah. And it was just an amazing thing. Do you remember what happened to Jeff Miller? Our, oh my, my best friend. <laughs> I do remember. My boy Jeff. I think you want to tell I'm this part of the story, the bus, Jeff. I know you're probably listening. Number three under the bus. Poor yeah. Jeff comes in. He's working for a, a big credit union called Sunmark back then, and he comes in. He brings all kinds of. He's carrying a box of. They stuff. They were doing like the pre-approvals and stuff for yeah, people. I think loan pre-approvals yeah. and whatnot. He walks in. He bent over for somebody. Split his pants wide open. <laughs> <laughs> He put his pants right over, and I'm like, oh, he, he left, and went and bought another pair of pants, and came back. So, oh my God, Jeff and I were just pretty new friends at that point. Just that was hilarious. So, anyways, but then the house still didn't sell. It did not. This went on forever. It did not sell. We waited. We waited. We waited. We finally, I called another agent who was a top agent in the area, and I said, look, at I, I can't sell this thing. Do you? He worked with only top people, and I said, can you sell it? He said, yeah, your price too high. I said, you think so? He said, yeah. And so he gave some suggestions, and I, I couldn't bring myself to pay. 6% commission for him to sell it because that have been another 50 grand yeah. down the toilet. And I'm like, I can't, we've got to figure this out. So we ended up lowering the price and sold it for like 540, some $540,000 or something like that. But we were, by the time we were all said and done with holding costs, repairs, all the over repairs, we had to over borrow yeah. the money. The, the $40,000 in extra staging. Yeah, that was a whole debacle in itself. So that was, that was crazy. And we ended up losing $147,312. Yeah, deal. that was not a fun day. Are you liking this episode? Are our horror stories going to help you or haunt you? If you like it, make sure you subscribe for even more content. And make sure you hit that notification button so you don't miss anything in the future. So I think it's important for people to know a couple things. One, like we've said along the way, you really have to make sure you stay in your buy box. If you have a production so model. So important. Yeah, if you have a production model that's, that's spitting out the same product over and over and over again, stay in that. Yeah. And be good because we jumped. We, we, we took a swing for the fences. We thought we could make a quarter of a million dollars in profit. On that deal, it turns yeah. out it cost us one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, at, at, and it's funny. I I need to take my own advice here because at our workshops we always tell people, you know, don't make emotional decisions. And even you know, you you were partially emotional because of the story behind sure. it. You know, it was your the well, plus. Woman. I wanted to make a quarter million dollars too. True. Let's not. But then, but that. then I also was partially emotional too because for me as a designer, it was just fun to do something different. It yeah. was fun to do something higher end. It was fun to do something that would have different colors and, and yeah. whatever. So, but it was so different that it took way longer to design and renovate and the cost of it. We, we didn't know how to calculate all that. You know what else we didn't know? We didn't know at that point. We were too green to understand multiple exit strategies. Yeah. Now, looking back. We should have wholesaled that. We should have wholesaled it. All day long. We should have bought it for 250 and sold to somebody else for 300 or 350 Yeah. Because it was fully livable. Yeah. So we could have also bought it. And after 90 days, we could have listed it back. We could have listed it right away. We could have listed it right back on the MLS and sold it as is. Yeah. And I bet we could have cleared $100,000, $150,000 in profit and never touch it. Yeah. Because it was fully livable and people would have paid less money for it. They could have just put their own touches in it. It wasn't like it, it wasn't a piece of junk. It was livable. No, it was a beautiful house. It was. It was a little dated. But well, not, not after bad. we finished it, though. Yeah. It wasn't dated after we finished it. You know, like I'm just having this aha moment right now as we're sitting here. 
Honestly, it's been, it's been a decade. It's a little bit late to be thinking about it now. I know. <laughs> but, you know, whatever. Yeah. So if we would have just taken the Tudor trim off of the outside and just repainted the outside and made it not look like a Tudor, <laughs> we probably would have sold it. You thought that 10 years later was a good time to make sure that idea? That, that's a great idea, actually. But really, thanks a lot. Honey. I know. Well, well played. I know. Well, I'm thinking about the exit strategy. That's so important because, you know, now every time we get a piece of property and we look at what is what is the best way to make money in this house in the shortest amount of time? Do we wholesale it? Yeah. Do we fix and flip? Do we do a quick flip? Or do we do a full-on renovation? And I think looking back, we have houses now that we've, we've bought now for a couple hundred thousand dollars and sold them for like 275 to other people because they're livable. Make a quick 50, 60 grand after yeah. all expenses and never touch it and walk away. Yeah. And I think we weren't thinking about that because we were so focused on, hey, let's make this house look beautiful that we just weren't thinking about the other ways to make money in houses. So that's it's so that was before we really started doing any wholesaling. Unfortunately. And I'm not even saying wholesaling. I'm saying just buy and sell. Yeah, true. Like we weren't doing that either though. No. Because we weren't thinking that there was a way to make money. We wanted the that. glamour of the before and after and we wanted that people, whole story. People to pat us in the back and say you guys are making the house look beautiful and all that. Which goes back to my point I was making before is we made emotional decisions instead of business decisions. Yeah. If we had made a business decision on that, we probably would have profited quite well. So this is 10 years too late, but let's play a little game here. Like, what would we do now? So there's a lot of different exit strategies. We were just mentioning a few of them. But what if we even turned it into a short-term rental? You know, they weren't necessarily as popular. Well, but but come forward and say, what if we did it today, right? We can't, right. Go, we can't go back in time. Right. So let's, let's say, what if we had that today? It had a pool. It had an indoor hot tub, which we know is a really big thing in upstate New York. You know, that because that, we have one at our house, which is now a short term rental and yeah. people love the hot tub. This one's indoor. Yeah. So that would have been a bonus. It had multiple rooms. So, you know, you could have had two or three families come in there and rent it all at the same time. I don't think that would make sense financially. Maybe the, not because of how much we paid for it and renovated it. And the tax alone are $18,000, right? Yeah. So you're paying. But we already that? had the $40,000 of furniture in there. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, yeah. We, so but the point is. We would have had to try and get our, so we, we had all that money. We, we probably end up borrowing about 550000 yeah. in investor money. We owed them over 600000 or or whatever it was with interest. So we would have had to do a cash out refinance to pay them off. Right. And we were already over our heads. So that, that although that may, that may have been a nice rental, if we didn't have a huge mortgage, the mortgage would have been too high to justify those costs, right? So the next exit would be, could we, could we just rent it? Same problem. Yeah. Even right. a long-term rental is the same. Plus, who wants to rent? I mean, that's a big house to rent. Yeah. There, there's a hospital right nearby, so possibly, you know, you could have doctors that want to come in there, but I, I just don't think that... It was just, it was enormous, remember? It, it was. was. It's just an enormous house. It was so a really big house. It, and just, it was grand. Everything about it was grand. So what what else would could we have done with that house that would have been better for us that people can learn from today? Probably the the just doing minimal work to it and selling it. That, that back, probably would have been our best exit, either that or wholesaling it. I think we had a leaky roof. We had to fix a, a roof in one section. We had some carpet that was bad, but nothing major. Right. Right. And I think we, re, we redid the whole staircase. We probably didn't have to. It was wood. We made Not it iron. Not if we were just going to sell it. Correct. Yeah. yeah. The fireplace, we could have painted. Yeah. The, it was a dual fireplace. You could look You could look from the dining room to the kitchen. Or the, remember that? I you do, You could have yeah. a see-through. And so that we could have just cleaned up and made it look better. But we probably could have gotten out of that thing with less less than twenty grand, right? Do you think? And sold it. Uh, it depends on the kitchens and baths. I don't remember exactly what we did. I, I don't remember exactly what it looked like before. I remember what it looked like after. After I would, I'd be willing to bet that we could put we could put twenty twenty five thousand dollars in that house and and sold it for probably three to three fifty to four hundred thousand. Yeah, because it was still assessed for six ninety nine. So people right. would look and go, "Wow, that's a good deal." You can, you can use that as a selling tool to get them to come in the door. Would you agree on that? I do. So that's possible. Um, you know, something else you could do nowadays, what do they call that? They call it, uh, there's a certain kind of rental that's happening right now. I forgot the name of it right now. Oh, midterm rental? Uh, midterm rental. Mid, mid, no, midterm rental, or you can do where, where young professionals rent rooms. Right. They rent rooms in a house, but you have to have, you know, common bathrooms and that kind of stuff. That's a possibility because that house would have maybe generated about mm -hmm. five, 500 bucks a month per room. Maybe. They had like seven bedrooms or some crazy thing. So I'm just saying that that's, these are options of what you could do with a house like that when you get into a, a situation. But I, I think overall- Hindsight's 2020 <clears throat> though. Overall, yeah. we know we screwed up. We know what we did wrong. We know what bad decisions we made. And probably the biggest was not making the business decision and, and looking at our different exit strategies. Yeah. And choosing the right one. Yeah, because I think looking back, I wouldn't have not bought it. It was, we bought it too cheap to not buy it, I think we should have just put it right back on the market and yeah. sold it as is. 
even if we had to hold it for 90 days or six months for seasoning, right. seasoning for those of you guys who are listening, is some, some banks require that you hold a house for a certain amount of months before you put it on the market. So like if you have an F if the buyer has an FHA loan. Because if you if you just buy it and sell it for more, some of the banks say, well, I have to see receipts of what you did to the house. If you didn't do anything, we won't loan money in the house. Yeah. So sometimes that could happen. But in, in today's market, we're finding more and more that if it appraises, that the banks are usually okay with it. So Or even one more exit strategy that we didn't talk about burn it. would be <laughs> oh, sorry. to to J V it. <laughs> I do oh, a joint JV. venture with the we with the seller. That. That's a really that's a really good point, Amber. All right, let's talk about JV for a minute. This is a great this is a great segue. Because that, that could JV. have been a really good house to do that with. Absolutely. Okay, so a joint venture is when you partner with the seller and don't buy the house directly. So if you have the house that's in your name. And I come to you and say, Amber Schwarm, you have the same last name as me. How about that? But so you're the seller, and I come to you and say, I I want to help you sell this house, but obviously it needs work. It needs a hundred grand worth of work into it. You keep the house in your name. I'm going to come in with my money, which I'm going to borrow from a private investor, and I'm going to fix up the house, and then we're going to sell it. You're going to give me reasonable access to the house through a document. What it is, it's a power of attorney that limits me to the transactions for that particular house. So you don't have to worry about it anymore. You step away and don't worry. We agree that up front, you're going to get $250,000 when I sell this house. So I'm going to fix it, sell it, and at the closing table, you get your $250,000. I keep the rest. And you can often pay the sellers more than but, you could if you were going to buy it outright because there's no holding costs. Yeah, but or I, minimal holding costs. But I wouldn't want to on that deal. Of course. But I'm just saying in some cases, that's also how you make a deal work that wouldn't otherwise work. Yes. We're probably confusing people with a JV. The bottom line is, though, I can do a joint venture, partner with you. If I have the right paper, I can partner with you where you keep the house so you still own the property. My risk is I'm putting the money in to renovate the house, but I'm going to sell it for much more. Now, if I sell that house for 550000 and not try and get 700000 for it, I'm not going to have all those holding costs. I'm not paying the taxes. I'm going right. to have the seller keep paying the taxes because she still owns the house, right? And I'm going to just take care of what I have borrowed on my house. So at the end of the day, that's a great way to make money in that house too without taking on all the risk. Yep. So a lot of different ways to do it. I think it's just important that you understand that multiple different exit strategies can be applied to any given house. You have to look and say, what is the best and fastest way for me to get out of this? But I think that for most people, if you're not used to doing that kind of house, you shouldn't do it. I'm going to tell you one more before we go today. Last year, as you know, we bought a nine-unit apartment. Let's call it a complex because it's five acres of land. Yeah, it's kind of a weird property. It's five acres of land. It's two buildings, yep. a barn that's over 100 years old, big old barn, another garage, and again, on five acres of land, commercial property. My team found that off-market deal for $224,000. Great deal, except that the owner hadn't touched the rents in over a decade. Yeah. Or the renovations. People were paying 400 bucks in rent in yeah. there. And Which it was, is nothing. Didn't make any repairs. People didn't complain because they knew they were getting a steal for rent. Right. So we take over the property and think, hey, this is going to be a cash cow. We picked it up for 250. We'll put a couple hundred grand into it. It'll be worth a million bucks. We're good to go. Well, not so much. Because again, that's not in our wheelhouse. Yeah. Our project manager doesn't know exactly how to renovate an eight. We thought it was a nine unit. Turns out it's an eight unit because one of the properties was illegal. One of the one of the apartments so we lost the unit out of the gates. Didn't yeah. didn't check that out thoroughly, and now we're going through renovating one by one. But now because of New York State having all these crazy laws, you can't just have people leave the end of their term. You have to give them like ninety days notice, and you have to. And I feel bad. Yeah, and for the, them. the challenge is, is there's people living in many of these yes. units, so renovating them is a As they major moved, challenge. Yes, once we raised the rent, people moved out. Then we could go ahead and and renovate the properties. And it got really complicated. We are still dealing with that. And in April, we'll have owned it for one year. And I'm just now doing a cash out refi to get our private investor money yeah. off of that property. And it's almost done. But it's it's been, because it's out of our buy box, it has set us back. Yeah. And it confused my whole team. Yeah. So we're going to be much smarter about what we do going forward and what we put in front of our team. Because if you're, if you're trying to do 10 different things at once, you get confused. Yeah. You will... I, do you but agree? We have, we have learned a couple things. So like like we went there, you you showed me that property last time we were in New York for our son's wedding. And I walked in that barn and like the designer in me is like, oh my gosh, this could be amazing. Like there's these really cool rafters. There's like a brick floor. Like right. you could turn that into the coolest, trendiest place to oh, either yeah. like 
post weddings or even turn it into like a, a condo or yeah, like yeah. it could be really, really cool looking. But money wise, business wise, that doesn't make any sense at all to do. Right. So we, you know, over the years, we have learned some lessons. So let's not knock ourselves too much for that. But as far as yeah. like the renovating, it's it's just better to stay in your buy box. What's that baseball saying? Like you don't win games with home runs. You win them with base, base hits. hits. Yeah. That's what we need to stick with. Base hits because those yeah. are those are very plug and play for us. Yeah. Anytime we seem to go outside of that normal buy box and get into these bigger projects, we end up struggling. Yeah. I think the, the lesson from all this today is that the grass may look greener, but it's probably not greener. Yeah. And you probably should stay. Especially if you don't have the systems ready for it. it right. Because, because it, the people that do have the systems that are set up for that do very, very well. Yeah. But if your system isn't set up for that, um, you have another saying like, like you know, when you get squeezed, what comes out? You, yeah, you get squeezed. You, when you, when you, you get, get squeezed, squeezed, you come out. When you, when you squeeze an orange juice, when you squeeze an orange, orange juice comes out. When you get squeezed, you come out. You come out. So if, you're, if your systems are set up, your business model is set up to do those little base hits, those three or four bedroom houses, you should stick with that and maybe maybe grow incrementally, but yeah. don't just like go from that to taking on something big So because you're going to get squeezed. I'm thinking about this. When you watch these online gurus and nurus, there's some people right now that many of you who are listening know know this gentleman's name. I know him. I've met him. Nice guy. But I uh, I spent a long time. We had lunch with his partner. Yeah. And I don't want to say his name. He's a nice guy. I'm not trying to throw him on the bus, but he's very popular for doing subject two deals online and Oh, I just bought an eight unit. I just bought a 30 unit. I just bought a double family. I just bought this. I bought that. I'm buying in this area of the country and this area of the country. And I'm over here. And I'm in Alabama and I'm in, I'm in Tennessee and I'm over here in Florida and I'm over here. And I'm like, how in the heck is he managing all yeah. that? So at lunch, I said, he's claiming to buy all these things. How is he keeping this all together? Remember what he said? He goes, it's he, a shit show. He goes, he goes, it's a shit show. I said, okay. Yeah. So behind the scene, there, there's the image online. And there's the reality. We yeah. try and be the real image on both plays. I've always been very authentic, right? We've always been yep. very authentic. And so people put on this front like, oh, you can do this in all different areas around the country. Not really. And take on any kind of project, yeah. whether it's commercial or residential I or how big or small. Yeah, I think you're asking for a problem. I think you just get really good at your buy box. Look at what BlackRock is doing. Right. They're buying up all that. You know, they're buying up single family tens homes. of thousands of houses, but they're single family homes. Yep. And there's a buy box they fall into. And if they fall in that buy box with, with the year bill, with the type of construction, with location, the state it is, all these different things. If they stay in their buy box, they become wildly successful. Mm -hmm. But the minute you start going outside your buy box, you start getting hurt. Yep. And you've got to be so cautious and so and careful. It, you and it don't takes your focus away too. It, so, more so not, than you think. So not only, you know, the, the amount of time, like even if we were, you know, broke even or made a profit on that house, we could have done so many other deals during that time that we probably would have surpassed what we had hoped to make in the beginning. We tied up what, 700,000 or 600,000 worth of investor yeah. funds. That at the time was so worth that, three more deals. That focus that we were so, you know, trying to get that job done, we could have just done the same thing and without all the headache. Yeah. Craziness. So just when you get started, stay focused on what you're doing, stay in your buy box. And that's the best way to be successful. Learn from our mistakes. And we hope that today's episode kind of helps you with that. That concludes this episode of the Fearless Future podcast. Hey, we would love your feedback. Do you have any horror stories that you'd like to share or questions? We will do our best to answer anything. And if you enjoyed this, make sure you like our video. It helps this channel. And make sure you click that notification and subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss anything in the future.